Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jan Bug. I'm from Brown and Crouppen Law Firm. Brown and Crouppen has been a proud sponsor of the Webster DE&I Conference for several years. I'm so glad to be here with my team on behalf of the firm to introduce this session, Trends in the Workplace and School, Best Practices and Belonging. This discussion will, will examine best practices for office and school policy and culture. We also look through a legal lens at what's at stake for trans individuals under current and proposed legislation. We would like to note that in this session, our guests will share their personal lived experiences with us. Um, so please exercise thoughtfulness and sensitivity in your participation. The discussion will be moderated by Webster's own Vincent Flewellen. Joining Vincent, we have Dr. Alicia Warren, Executive Director of the Missouri Commission on Human Rights. Welcome. Michelle Lewis, an Associate in the Employment and Labor Practice at Armstrong Teasdale. Hayden Molina Rollo, a videographer and creative specialist here at Webster University. Meg Gwynn, Senior Human Resources Business Partner, and Noel Nance, a first-year student studying game design, also here at Webster University. Take it away, Vincent. Thanks, Jay. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I'd like to maybe just start just really briefly, if you could just kind of share just a quick little Snippet in your association to this topic. First. You can go first. Okay, darn it, I'm in the first seat. That means I have to go first. Well, I'm Dr. Lisa Warren, and I have known Vincent for 10 years now, since my daughter was a middle school student when he was um, at uh, Ladue Middle School, and she was his favorite teacher. I mean, absolute favorite. So I've kind of been stalking him for years, and I've been <laughs> to this conference for years. But my entry into this topic is really a personal one, and my journey has been a very personal one and not one that I'd planned for. Um, so my daughter, Marissa, who I was hoping, she's in college right now, she's 21, and if she, she got out of class at 10.30, so I don't think she's gonna make it over here, but if she does, if someone comes rushing in, that's her. But, um, so she was here to support. But um, she is, um, a student currently in college, she's 21 years old and studying engineering aviation right now. Um, so she's gonna be a pilot. And so she goes to school with most primarily men, primarily white men. Uh, but Marissa came out to me when she was eight years old. Okay, so I'm coming to this from the perspective of a parent, right? And just to be honest with you about that, um, when she shared with me her, um, Sexual orientation, I guess, is the right word. And I, I, first of all, I loved Ben this morning. He's my new best friend. Wherever he is, I'll be emailing you because all of that information, if you didn't get it, it was great stuff this morning, mm -hmm. so I loved mm -hmm. it. But um, she shared with me at eight years old who she was, and I was in awe of her. She's eight. I mean, she's eight years old. For her to be so self-aware of who she was, I was just in awe of that. And I was proud of that. I was proud at how brave she was, that she felt like she could talk to me, because I know that so many children and young people don't feel like they can talk to their parent about who they are, who they truly are, who their authentic self is. And so I was really proud of her. But behind closed doors, behind the scenes, you know, after we talked and I, I spent most all of my time listening to her, trying to understand where she was coming from and uh, really just kind of drinking it in and mm -hmm. thinking, oh my God, how am I gonna support, you know, this child who I love with all my heart and all my being, mm -hmm. I need to support her throughout her life, throughout her experiences. But after she left the room, my feeling was total and complete panic and fear and tears. And I'll be honest with you because I was so afraid how the world would treat my baby, right? How is the world gonna treat my child that I loved so much? And the field that I work in, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, is I head up the Missouri Human Rights Commission in the Missouri Department of Labor, and we investigate discrimination complaints, okay? So I see it every day in what we do. And I know how mean and nasty and ugly people can be and um, to other humans. And so that was my fear as a parent, is how they were gonna treat Marissa, knowing that she was um, black, 
that she was gay, that she was uh, female, and she was in a predominantly male profession, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and what that looked like throughout her life. So I've always been there to support her, but it's been a journey. It has, and I know many of you have been on that journey as well. So this is, I'm coming from a mom perspective. Thank you very much. Michelle. Hello, thank you everyone for having me. My name is Michelle Lewis, and I am an attorney at Armstrong Teasdale Law Firm in Clayton, Missouri. My primary areas of practice are labor and employment, and I also work in our higher ed industry uh, team group, so. Thank you. Absolutely. Hayden. Hi everyone, I'm Hayden. Uh, I work here at the university, I'm a videographer. I also went to school here. Um, I myself am non-binary, and uh, Webster has historically been uh, an inclusive place in terms of culture, even as a student, it's where I first learned about the term non-binary, it's where I learned the language that sort of grounded me in my identity. And I'm kind of, I kind of come to this a little bit later in life. I'm, I'm still young, I'm 30, but you know, I wish I could have realized this when I was a teenager or 18 or whatever. So I kind of want to be here to sort of share my experience so that people younger than me don't have to go through some of the obstacles that I've had to go through. Thank you, Hayden. Noel? Uh, hi there, I'm Noel Lance. I uh, actually debuted that appearance for the first year that I was here. I'm uh, currently a freshman majoring in game design. Uh, and my name, Noel Lance, the uh, pronoun she, her, all came out when I first introduced myself here at the school. Uh, prior to that, I was still just my regular self, uh, even though I had already expressed sort of previous ambitions to explore new identity, I never got to fully realize that until I came here because I realized it was time that I could take action for myself and make a fresh start. So I'm very glad that throughout my time here at Webster, it's been incredibly inclusive. All the students have been able to appreciate and acknowledge that. And so far I've been very happy with what I've experienced. Thank you. Thank you for your courage and bravery as well today. Meg. And hi, I am Meg Wynn. I'm excited to be here, a part of Webster University, uh, part of the human resources team, and a member of the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, important to be um, a part of this and glad to be here. Thank you all. And just for, um, I am also uh, black and gay, and I am also proud to be a part of this conversation here. Uh, Dr. Warren, I'd like to maybe start with you, if you can kind of share with us you know, the big picture at the state level, what's going on, what are some challenges um, there, and if you could speak to anything in particular. Sure, Vincent, I'm glad to do that. Well, so the big picture as far as, so the Missouri Commission on Human Rights is a state agency. So we enforce the human rights laws across the state of Missouri. And that includes employment discrimination, housing discrimination, and discrimination in places of public accommodation, like here, where we are in public. Um, so, and those, those, um, protected categories include the ones that, that we all think about, which might be race, age, sex, uh, you know, gender, national origin, uh, ancestry, uh, disability, and families with children and housing. So those are kind of the broad umbrella protected categories. I will say that for sex, and I, I have some notes okay. here, so because I don't want to forget anything. I brought a few notes. But as far as this coverage of sex in Missouri, it's a little bit, um, maybe stop short of what maybe many people would like to see covered in sex for the state for a state law. And I think you saw in Ben's uh, graphics earlier, mm -hmm. the map. Mm -hmm. So Missouri was bright red, right? Get, well, we were kind of red, Let's getting ready to under. be dark red, right? Mm -hmm. It's what it looked like. And I think our attorney friends here are gonna talk more about what the laws are looking like. But so our state has laws that really they um, have protection for sexual harassment, which is you know quid pro quo harassment. You know, you sleep with me or I'll fire you, right? The the kind everybody knows about, or you know, hostile work environment. That's covered under sex in uh, the Missouri Human Rights Laws. Um, also, pregnancy is covered, right? So anything related to childbirth or uh, health health issues related to pregnancy is covered. Uh, sex stereotyping is covered under Missouri's Human Rights Act. But that is, for example, if you are, you're being stereotyped because you are, you are female, but you don't present female. You don't dress, you work at a bank, but you don't, you know, you dress like 
a dude, which is one of the things my daughter gets called all the time is, hey, dude, you know, and I'm like, does that bother you at all? She's like, no, I'm good with it. She's non-binary, too. She's cool with it. It doesn't bother her. But, um, but you don't present as, you know, mm-hmm. that way. So that stereotyping is covered. Um, but there are some nuances, too, in the laws that really don't go as deep as, say, the federal law would, and I think we're going to talk more about that um, in, in Missouri's law. So there, there's room for opportunity to grow in our state. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Michelle, do you want to talk in terms of what those laws are federally? And, 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 and... Sure, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Vincent. And I, uh, Dr. Warren, I, I, yes, I have my notes too. Um, because Simply because there's so much legislation happening in the state of Missouri, as Dr. Warren alluded to. And it, it is, um, you know, a lot of it is currently at the introductory level, like, you know, bills are being uh, introduced into Missouri State Congress. However, uh, things are happening very, very, very rapidly. Um, as, as Dr. Warren stated, you know, federally, there are laws on the books that protect transgender status. Uh, some of you all may, you know, remember our, our most recent iteration of that, and I, I think it was actually very shocking the Supreme Court mm-hmm. made the ruling in Bostock, uh, Bostock pardon me, it was um, during the height of the pandemic in 2020, where the Supreme Court uh, basically included sexual orientation, transgender identities as protected characteristics as it pertains to employment. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's, it's, it's square within the context of you cannot discriminate against an individual on the basis of their transgender identity, on the basis of their uh, sexual orientation within employment. Unfortunately, we don't have similar legislation at the federal level that 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 provides that protection for students. Um, now, you know, a lot of people are like, well, wait, what about Title IX? Yes, Title IX is is a federal law. It is on the books. Um, and there are, you know, it, actually very recently, within the past year or so, the Biden administration actually did a notice of proposed rulemaking in which they they are making some, some rather substantive changes to Title IX as it pertains to protections, uh, primarily, n- not just solely within that space, but part of those rulemaking changes are providing greater protections for transgender students uh, with, under, the, under the umbrella of Title IX. However, there is still that missing piece, uh, the big elephant in the room, and that's transgender athletes, right? And that's, that's, that's the big unknown. So, you know, occasionally I will often be asked, like, well, what's going on with the status of trans athletes in, in, in schools? And you just hunt your shoulders. I don't know. Um, the Biden administration did, um, during this last rulemaking session, they, they did intimate that they are going to provide separate guidance on trans athletes and, and giving schools and colleges and universities direction in that regard. But that's yet to actualize. Um, so, so we have this protection for uh, members of the trans community uh, and, and members of the LGBTQ plus community within the context of employment. Um, but there is, no, there is no similar legislation as it stands now that will provide that level, that level of federal protection for students. Um, having said that, um, Missouri State in particular is working very, very, um, very actively on putting state laws on the books that would greatly impact um, tra- the members of the trans, I'm sorry, members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I, I've taken time to to cite to a couple of them and I, I because I think words matter, mm-hmm. um, yeah. language matters. And I think, you know, just understanding what's at stake, what is, uh, what these laws, uh, what these pieces of legislation are designed to impact, um, it, it's, it's helpful to know that. And so if you will allow me, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, I think at last I checked, there were over 30 iterations mm. of bills, uh, and some of them are very, very similar language. Some of them are very, very, very similar, but again, either at the House level or at the Senate level, over 30 iterations of legislation that have been introduced in Jefferson City um, to, um, to that would poten- that will not potentially, that will greatly impact members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, some of the more notable ones, there is a House bill 
which would prohibit public schools, colleges, and universities from requiring students to engage in any form of mandatory gender or sexual diversity training or counseling. Mm. That's, that's wow. a mouthful there. Um, there's the Do No Harm Act, which would require medical institutions of higher ed to submit an annual certification that the institution does not require applicants or students to subscribe to DEI ideologies. This bill will also prohibits institutions from conducting DEI audits or hiring DEI consultants. Um, you know, many of you all know about the Save Women's Sports Act. Um, I think out of all of the legislation that's being introduced, the Save Women's Sports Act seems to be getting the most traction in terms of there's actually floor action with this particular bill. Um, and. Again, it has not been introduced to the Senate yet. It has not gone to the to the governor for signing. But many believe, because I think there are several other states that have already enacted similar mm -hmm. legislation as it pertains to, um, to students participating in sporting activities on the basis of their identities assigned at birth. Um, and the last thing I will, because I don't, I don't want to just completely bum everybody out about legal, legal legislative acts. Um, something else that, and, and a lot of people may not be aware of, but the NCAA is actually has introduced a policy that will go into effect in the fall of this year for this upcoming academic year. And they actually, it actually closely mirrors um, the Special Olympics and Paralympics uh, regulations that will require um, testosterone level testing mm. for, uh, for trans individual, um, transgender individuals. Um, so that is actually, that that's a good thing. Um, however, again, mm -hmm. much, a lot going on in the legal world. Um, I wanna hear from some of our other colleagues about their experiences. And I wanna just questions. ask a sure. quick follow-up question. Um, you talked in terms of legislation, the constitution um, protecting uh, trans identity, uh, uh, but does that work? I mean, you talk about employment, but what about in housing or what about in, you know, the other avenues of daily living? Thank you for bringing that up, Vincent. That, that there, there is proposed federal legislation that would address some of the, okay. that would expressly address uh, prohibitions against, say, for instance, I think um, the Equality Act okay. is, a, is a big one that has been introduced on the federal level that would provide express protections against, and prohibitions against housing, credit, jury service. Um, there is the- um, Cakes. Yes. Bakeries. <laughs> Bakeries, yes. Wow. That, that would be more like the Customer Non-Discrimination Act. It's also a federal piece that's, that, um, that has been introduced okay. that, would, that would cover any number of public accommodations and non-discriminatory non, uh, acts against individuals of the LGBTQ community. Um, there's actually even, I believe, um, a global act mm. that is looking to impact the framework in uh, at a U.S. diplomacy level and how LGBTQ uh, community members are treated around the world. Okay. And so, yeah, so there is this legislation out there. Um, no surprise, not a lot is happening in terms of, you know, bringing forward a lot of legislation and pushing it over the goal. But, but yeah, you know, and I think to your greater point, though, Vince, it has to happen at the federal level mm -hmm. because we That's see, right. you know, the what, what the states right. will, will. So do. that means that I technically could be denied housing as a member of the community. Well, you know, actually, the Fair Housing Act, and Dr. Warren, please chime in if I'm if I'm if I'm being incorrect. The Fair Housing Act does provide a protection again uh, for for in, uh, discrimination on the basis of sex, right. and within that definition of sex, they include gender identity and sexual orientation. Doctor, yeah, would you? That's correct, and they use the, the federal standard, which okay. has more pro broader protection. Okay, yeah. so that is protected. Yes. Okay, thank Housing, you. Housing, yes. Housing, yes. Housing. Um, Hayden, and, and, and I'd like to open up the floor in terms of some of the personal stories and um, processes uh, within work, you know, so the employment piece is protected, but how did the process go for you um, here at the university? Um, share. Uh, sure. So, um, as I said before, I went to school here um, from a student culture perspective. It's a very inclusive, very queer, 
um, very trans friendly campus. Like not even talking about the administration or like the system, just this, the culture here is, uh, that's just, it's kind of grassroots, right? So I, I've been a freelancer since I left college. So I haven't had a workplace uh, that's been consistent. I have clients, um, you know, I've worked at different agencies and stuff. And I've been lucky in the sense that I've been tolerated. Like people, mm. uh, Ben, I think Ben said something about sort of like the mental obstacle of like, oh, he is a they, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like once mm -hmm. that became, and, and also like the concept of being non-binary and they, them, singular pronouns has been around for a while, but it's pretty new and like the public mainstream lexicon. Um, so I felt, and also I pass, I'm stuck. I, I pass as a man, I'm stealth, you know? So it's like, I have sort of experienced my entire career as a man, I suppose, even though I wasn't, right? Um, and that's a sort of different type of distress that other than the sort of like, what we're talking about with uh, laws and the sort of like uh, existential like fear of like I might be fired, uh, I might be hate crimed, you know things like that. It's those things are always there. That's just the basis for any marginalized group, right? Um, but a sort of deeper, more subtle level is sort of like I am different. I have to constantly explain or defend like what I am, I have to like educate people, I have to like validate that even though I look a certain way, even if you think I look like a guy, I'm not a guy, you know, that's like a lot of, it's like death by a thousand cuts, right? So that's a very, at least from my community, my friends, my friends' personal experience, stuff like that, that's a pretty universal experience for any marginalized group, not just, not just queer or trans, but anything. Um, Webster, um, I needed healthcare. I want to go on hormone replacement therapy, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so I was like, I need to get a job, like a full-time job. So I, I don't, I, I need to, I need to feel right in my body. I need to get, go from dysphoria to euphoria, um, <laughs> you know? And Webster had an opening and, uh, I, I was in a process and this was last summer, by the way. So this is very recent. I've only been working here since August. Um, I was interviewing at another um, higher ed institution because um, that's what most of my freelance work has been. And in the interview, this other institution, um, they asked what I thought about DEI. You know, what, what is my perspective of DEI? That was one of the questions out of all the technical things. And I found myself giving a stock answer. I didn't come out, I didn't tell them I was trans. I didn't say anything about that. I just sort of, you know, talked about, yeah, it's it's important and these, you know, whatever, whatever I learned in my gender studies class here at Webster. Um, something just didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel safe doing it. And it wasn't like I thought that they wouldn't hire me. It's that I'm going to have to completely educate, <laughs> defend, when I say defend, I mean I have to like prove that I am trans or, or queer enough or whatever. I have to like educate people what that even means. Oh, you don't look like you're trans, you don't look like a girl, you know, these types of like little comments or whatever. So I interviewed at Webster as well. Um, instantly more comfortable because I went to school here. I knew that this is a progressive institution. Um, and I've worked for a lot of other institutions like in a freelance capacity. Um, I felt safer here to um, sort of express myself and who I identify as in my, in my interview. Um, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say this right at the front. I don't want to like introduce this slowly. I want to know that I'm supported right now. It's like I'm trans. I plan on transitioning, uh, gender affirming healthcare, whatever that might mean. Um, I use they, them pronouns. Um, and this is important to me because I don't want to continue 
interacting with my career and my workplace as a stealth man. Um, I'm willing to put in the effort to help educate people who might not be aware of a non-binary identity or gender fluid identity, but this is something that I just have, to, it has to be out. So I guess from my perspective, and everyone was great, you know, I'm still here, um, <laughs> you know. Um, Vincent, um, we had a conversation uh, mm -hmm. right after my interview, mm -hmm. um, and we worked on a strategy with each other to sort of educate and uh, make people aware of my pronouns, my identity, in a way that I was comfortable with. There was always consent, which is really great. Consent is very important uh, for a lot of things. I'll probably be saying that word a lot here. Um, and uh, in a way that wasn't overly taxing on me. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I might be, at least in our department mm -hmm. and area, I might be the first openly non-binary yes. um, staff member. Um, I'm not the first non-binary staff member. I, I'm absolutely sure of that, you know, but openly. Openly. Um, and me and Vincent worked personally closely together. Vincent, we we settled on you kind of going to uh, the other staff members individually, one-on-one, -on -one, kind of explaining to them, like, hey, um, Hayden uses they, them pronouns, this and that, like, you know, I don't know exactly what you said, but <laughs> you were a sort of, like, buffer for me to have to, like, uh, as Ben mentioned, I don't know who's here for Ben's, but like to be the well-spoken educator, you know, the the perfect trans person to like tell everyone, you know, that takes work. It's you know? tiring. It's tiring. Anyone, I'm sure anyone with uh, any intersection of like a marginalized identity can relate to that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not just here, but it, it is very tiring and taxing. We we all live in intersections. I am not just a non-binary person. I am a musician, you know? I am a, a worker here. I'm a videographer. And spending so much time focusing on my gender identity, uh, you know, it's, it's great. It's great for everyone to understand and know, but I, I wanna work. I wanna do, I just wanna like come here and I want it to be easy. And it is, if you're a cisgendered person, it is easy to just be like numb as that. You don't have to think about your gender as often, right? So, um, but I guess to uh, I guess to wrap up, Webster, um, and this isn't just an advertisement for Webster. We have, you know, there are things there's that need still to be, work to be there's done. There's still work to be done for um, sure, and I'm happy to help with that, right? Um, but Webster has, as I, as I've said before, has a ground up culture of, of, of diversity. And uh, it is, I think it's a reflection of like the students that are here. And I think that the administration um, is validating and recognizing that and learning from that. I like so, the use of the word validating versus tolerating, right? Yes. And it's yes. that existence and being able to see you in your wholeness as a worker, as someone's child as right a friend to yeah. someone right and that you show up and are given the permission so to speak that says like come as you are sure. right and and so i do recall that conversation in which you know hey you had actually only been here like eight days so like one full week and three days and hayden came a knocking at my door and said um some of my colleagues are still messing up, they're misgendering me. And one might in that moment have said, it's only eight days, <laughs> give people time. But instead, Hayden said, I don't want this to become a pattern that I later have to undo, right? And so that is when we had this conversation and, and, and you know, fortunately enough for us, third and fourth floor is, is, you know, that's that staff. We all report to the chancellor. And from the chancellor's office, one-on-one -on -one conversation with her to, you know, your boss, yeah. right? I had that conversation. And it was just a simple conversation of, you know, Hayden has said this is going really well for the most part. Mm -hmm. 
But Hayden has asked that we really be intentional about and that we stop for a moment because they do not want this to become a problem, right, ongoing. And to have that courage, A, to come and to say that, right, and for us in strategy together to be able to in collaboration figure out, as you said, this whole piece of consent. I would never do anything that would in any way make you or any other student, staff, colleague, friend not feel comfortable off of the ramifications or percussions of what I have chosen to do, right? And so I think that consent piece is very, very important. Um, Noel, I met you like during student orientation, I believe it was, and we had an affinity group of um, LGBTQIA plus uh, students and, and, and staff. And we had, and Ben's comments this morning reminded me of that, but we had um, pronouns and we asked everyone to use pronouns. Share that story and your decision in that moment to take that brave step. So as uh, Vincent said, yes, it was sort of the first time that I was introduced to the LGBTQ culture of Webster was there at the affinity group at the round table. And uh, just, I didn't like initially start the conversation or anything. Obviously I let other people go through because I was just a new face. I didn't really want to put myself out there just yet until I felt as if I had the chance, but hearing a lot of people going through their stories of just like uh, the sort of struggles that they've faced prior and the progression that they're making sort of inspired me to realize that at that moment, it would have been my chance to sort of put myself out there and, uh, explain more about what I've been through personally and what that means to me. So uh, I'm going to go back in time a little bit. Uh, it was all the way, I'd say probably in middle school. I had a group of three other friends. They were all females and to them, I was the most detached. And it was sort of at that point with that group that I realized something was different about me. Uh, I noticed that I had a connection with these other people unlike anybody else that I'd know, because all the other boys at the time were the sort of like sportsy guys. They specialized in basketball and soccer and that sort of thing, which never really resonated with me. So I felt connected to sort of females in that in a different sense, but that sort of transcended later as I started to understand more about why that was the case. Uh, I'm still friends with some of the people in that group. It's been very nice to have that connection throughout all these years, but over time, I would sort of I started to develop a new personality, going through the process of deciding what names to go through. Because uh, as a game design major, I was very much online at the time, so the concept of usernames was actually not unfamiliar to me, and that's sort of how I viewed it. It was sort of just attaching an alias to myself, which I could use at any point. I could switch out just to experiment what it would feel like. So I had been through that quite a couple times, trying to put forward what the best like position for me would be. Uh, I had settled on a few things for a couple of years and eventually I decided that I kind of wanted to present this idea to other people. So of course my parents, because mm. I knew that this would be something that didn't, it didn't shake off right away. This feeling kept up for many years and I was like, well, that must mean something, right? So eventually it came to the process of trying to explain to my parents and to my mom I felt most connected just because I felt like uh, she worked at Mercy Hospital so I felt like she would kind of understand the process a little bit more given how there's an entire thing about like hormone replacement therapy and gender affirming health care which I feel like she might understand a little bit more given her stance on on it so it came about time to talk to it and it was not easy uh, <laughs> Of course, me being you know a teenager at the time, it was very hard to formulate my feelings because I was always a little bit uncertain about how I actually felt. I didn't know if this was certain, and I knew that throughout the many communications that I'd had with other people who'd been through the same thing, that these changes would be permanent for the most part. So I was always a little bit uh, anxious about trying to explain that because I was not sure if I was ready to dedicate to such a thing. but. Then came the time to when I started graduating out of high school. Of course, high school was more or less the same. The guys, I got along with some of them. 
and the girls I got along more with just because there was a little bit of cultural disconnection between the two and I felt like I fit a little bit more with the female group. Uh, and then after that came college where I felt like finally I could sort of uh, establish my own personality and identity just purely based off of knowing that nobody else there had seen me before. It was a group of, it was a group full of uh, new faces, so it would be my first time sort of putting out my identity as I'd seen it at that moment. So to everybody in that group, once my time had come around, I told them, hi, I'm Noelle, and I go by she, her, <laughs> which at the time was a very big revelation. I had never done that before in the history of my life in front of a public group. So I felt like in that moment, I was sort of cementing the idea of who I was mm -hmm. and who I wanted to be in the future. So I'm glad to say as of now, uh, I've gone through the process a bit more with my parents. We've talked through it. Uh, my parents are both very supportive, which I am also appreciative of. I know that a struggle for a lot of trans youth is that their families are not the most supportive of that kind of cause. So I'm very happy to sort of not have to go through that myself. However, it still poses the struggle of getting to that next step. We uh, officiated a meeting with a doctor at Barnes going through hormone replacement therapy, but the meeting won't be for a few months in the distance, around July. So there's, there's already a lot of time involved because the healthcare is not the most prominent in our location. Uh, it's a bit of a struggle trying to get things timely because of course there are a lot of people out there who are now realizing that they can actually put themselves forward. So these changes are coming very suddenly and a lot of people have to be treated to, of course, including myself. So even though those are times set in the future, I'm just glad to be able to uh, feel confident in my decision now to sort of put myself out as a female, even if I don't physically look like one. Uh, I wanted to dress a little bit better, but the only time I had today was to do my hair, so. <laughs> but at the very least, I'm just comfortable with the fact that I could find friends here who I could explain the situation to, and they all go, oh, okay, great. So it feels, it's just very assuring, really. And even though not everybody gets it correct, I always consider the fact that these people probably won't be common reoccurrences in life. And even if they are, there will always be more opportunities to be, to uh, sort of speak up later on and tell them that I identify differently. Because all that matters for me right now is that I can confidently put forward a different name. The name is what people will be referring to me most. And as long as that change is being made first, I know that there is progress. So I'm very happy with how far I've gotten so far. And uh, I'm glad that, that Webster is as appreciative of our community as it is. It's great. I remember back in, sometime in the fall, we were at the Suggs. Noel is a recipient of the Suggs Scholarship, which is one of the most prestigious um, is one of two of the most prestigious scholarships here at the university and and we joined other universities it was about 1500 people i think in this ballroom and noel how'd you dress that day that oh, night had a lovely black dress on my hair tied back similarly to how it is now i wasn't wearing a hat sadly we had to be a bit more formal but the dress was very lovely looking and i felt <laughs> very just I felt great in that moment just being able to have on what I did and you were joined by your parents correct yes and family members which is fantastic right um, it's an experience unfortunately that so many members within the community just do not have that support and so the familial piece especially and so um, to see you just months later show up and, and I, I was just like yes in the full dress right like among 1,500 strangers. Um, it was fantastic. You actually even went to stage that way. So it's, it's great, and, and I'm, I applaud you for the work that you're able to do and feel for yourself. Meg, can you share with us some about your experience, but also from the role uh, here at the university and the work that you do on the HR team and how to create spaces that are more inclusive? Yeah. Um... So personally, I can very much identify with what Hayden was saying as far as when you're looking for a new job opportunity, um, really making sure that it's a diverse, inclusive um, culture, uh, first and foremost, um, being a part of the LGBTQIA plus community. 
Um, so that really resonates with me from um, a human resources perspective. And one of the things that I oversee is recruiting. So um, from a recruiting perspective, we make sure that we have very um, diverse, inclusive um, job boards that we're, that we're posting with. Um, it's very helpful for everyone to have that um, voice as far as DEI and creating that inclusive and safe community. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's always changing, it's always evolving. And so um, people having that voice and um, perspective of helping human resources and DEI um, departments to evolve where they need to is definitely very important. It was shortly after I came here, mm -hmm. Um, an individual had come forward who was going through a transition mm -hmm. and they wanted to be um, identified by their new name. And so um, being a part of the DEI community and working together, Vincent, um, on that chosen name change policy for employees was um, so fantastic. Um, and and has uh, that process has definitely been utilized like by a lot of employees to be um, identified by that that cho mm -hmm. chosen name change. Um, now having all gender restrooms in every single building of Webster University, that was fantastic to um, to be a part of that from an inclus inclusive perspective. Um, I'm sure there's many other benefits. That I'm what are the, some of the benefits? <clears throat> as far as health insurance yes. benefits? Yes. Yeah, so Hayden had touched on that um, a little bit as far as the inclusive pieces um, ready for, for um, in, in looking at your new opportunity or looking at new job opportunities, making sure that the health benefits uh, were inclusive there. Yeah. So there's, you know, obviously much work to be done uh, yet and still, but I also do want to take the time, you know, organizations that are out there that are looking to um, create a space that's much more inclusive. And there's some things at a very simple, basic level, right? You know, gender restroom pieces. Uh, how many of your restrooms actually have a lock because there's one stall, right? There's one. Why does it have to be marked one or the other? Why can't it be open to all? Yeah, when Ben was sharing previously how at um, in Jefferson City, yes. the men's restrooms are all open. There's no doors on there. Um, it was shocking to me. I didn't know that. Um, you know, there's, you, I feel like, you know, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a lot of inclusive and safe community pieces that I feel and then when there's those pieces sometimes it's just like oh my gosh you know it's it's um uh it's kind of it's kind of baffling but yes it is um in all uh ever evolving and yeah when GMC and you created that DEI video that's going to be fantastic recently creating that including that on our external um job board so many pieces. It's one of the things to run into and not run away from, right? And, 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 and more and more, I think our society is getting to a space. Again, much work to be done, but the ways in which I see the presence, you know, we heard Ben talk about the first time he saw the commercial that he saw himself in, as a part of, right? Um, the number of commercials where you see same sex, um, individuals together, you know, as couples, as families. Um, we have moved pretty quickly, I also believe in this work, but yet and all, there's still some stuff that is at risk. And I'd again like to come back and specifically talk about the things that are at risk and how we can, or what can we do to advocate? I mean, we're, we've heard some stories, some personal stories, right? This is also at, at jeopardy. And so let's kind of talk about some of those pieces there. And I'll, can I, my turn? Yeah. So one story, I'm thinking of a personal story that I didn't share, and maybe some of you have had this experience, but it was, I just kind of went into mama bear mode on this moment because I got a phone call from my daughter in college, and she's like, mom, 
the professor, well, so this is what happened. I'll just break, they had a seating chart in this room of pri primarily white male pilots, right? And my daughter looks male. She does. Her hair is cut short. She's beautiful. She has a beautiful smile. She's a, but she looks male. Mm -hmm. She presents male, and she's good. That's she's non-binary, and that's who she is. Um, and so she's sitting in her seat, you know. And, and the professor calls her name, Marissa Warren. Here, Marissa Warren. Here, you know, Marissa Warren. Here, mm. and he's like, oh, funny. You don't look like a Marissa Warren. And she, she was on the phone so fast with me. Now, that might seem minor, but when you're in a room full of people that don't look like you, who so now all the attention is on her as being different, as being kind of outed by the professor who should have provided a safe space and didn't. So she's on the phone with her mom, you know, the state director of the Human Rights Commission. <laughs> oh, I'm like, mistake. we're going over to that school right now. Let's go get their mind right, right? And so we, you know, we kind of did that. We had a conversation with the dean, a conversation with the professor, because this was a teachable moment, mm -hmm, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can get mad and ticked off, and but you've got to give grace, too. You've yeah. got to be able to use it as a teachable moment so that it doesn't happen again to somebody else, a new, a freshman that comes in and then gets outed like that in front of a classroom of a bunch of people that can't happen so i felt like that was an important pivotal moment mm -hmm. that we were able to make even a minute change mm -hmm. you know in in the bigger scope of things it wasn't a macro change but it was a, mo a small change and so i was proud of that and i was proud of her for telling me immediately and being brave enough again it takes a lot of bravery to to call it out when you see it whether it's you or someone that you care about uh, whether you are an ally or or you know it's you that's that's dealing with the situation so i was really proud of her for that that's great but, Thinking, um, Michelle, in terms of workplace as well as uh, institutions of higher learning, what is at risk in terms of them and for loss, for not moving along, not getting with the program and recognizing um, these identities? You know, that's, that's a great question, Vincent. I, you know, I mean, let's face it, we live in a litigious society. We do. It's... It's the reality. It's 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 who we are, um, and you know, I, you know, one of the things that Hayden touched upon was you know just, uh, and again, you know, and I you, you I echo what you said, uh, Vincent. Like, kudos to Hayden for 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 being in for, for being empowered enough to say, hey, the pronoun thing. It, this is a thing. Mm -hmm. Like this this is happening. We need to correct this. I'm sure Dr. Warren has a lot of anecdotal information around the complaints that she gets in regards to um, um, refusal to use preferred pronouns that can very 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 easily morph into a full-blown lawsuit um, where where that organization that institution that company um, that that college um, is, um, is is facing mm -hmm. a, a lawsuit um, because again, and, I, and you know, and I, I know we talked about you know Title IX and Title VII and the transgender athletes, but the, the federal law on the book still taught, still still um, includes gender identity mm -hmm. as a protected characteristic, mm -hmm. and so, so yeah, there there's a lot at stake, uh, and even in terms of like reputational damage, right. a lot of a lot of companies really really don't understand the magnitude of just word of mouth. You know, we live in a litigious society. We also live in a very, very social media tech savvy. Um, right. We're in the information age. Um, news travels fast, bad news travel faster, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, you know, individuals start talking on their various platforms about experiences, about uh, feelings of, um, of feeling not safe, of being um, mislabeled, harmed, marginalized, that word travels fast. And all of a sudden, that's not a company that you want to work for. That's not a school that you want to go to. Um, so so there, there, is, there is a lot if, if, like I said, we don't get this right. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and like I said, I, and Dr. Wan, I'm sure you have, you, you see it across your desk all the time. I see it um, from the legal side, you know, you can be sued for, for you know, you know, I know we talked, Hayden and I had an offline conversation. We were talking a lot about microaggressions. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so easy 
for microaggressions and just those everyday misplaced um, slights um, to morph again into full-blown either federal complaints, state complaints at the state level, the federal level, or full-blown lawsuits. So we, we gotta we we have to get this right, and it, it is is not is not always. Well, what does the letter of the law say? Well, what you know. How should we be moved as human, People. As, as human beings? That's right. right. Yeah, that's that's right. right. So if we can't be moved by the humanity piece, organizations should be moved, right, by the legal piece of this, right, right? and the reputation that they are having at risk. And so it's something that I, we really need to focus on. Um, I'm mindful of our time. I would like to open it up to the audience if there might be any questions. Yes. Yeah, it depends on the day and how I'm feeling, right? <laughs> it's like you have to choose your battles between do I have the energy to be in the place of like, hey, I'm a, you know, non-binary, they, them, you know, so that might seem simple, but you know, that takes, uh, it, constantly having to do that is a bit difficult. So it's like, do, sometimes I find myself personally, and this is different for everyone, you know, but personally, I pick my battles. I'm like, would I rather be misgendered or have to like, engage and like talk about my gender identity right um and it's like i have i, I think also you'll find that trans and non-binary people have like more patience and grace than most people you would meet because it's just like you know i don't blame someone for misgendering me especially if they don't know me we have we live in a we are we're socialized to like look at people in binaries, right? Especially in our specific culture. It hasn't always been this way. There are other cultures, indigenous cultures, uh, pre-colonial, like non-Western cultures, everything, uh, like the two gender uh, paradigm has not always been a universal truth, but we are so ingrained in that, in this society, that that's, you know, I'm kind of going off on a thing, but so I understand, we all understand, we're breaking out of the binary, we're breaking out of the norm. So it, it's sort of like, you can ask, I guess more to your question, you can maybe make it more, um, you can make it easier to the person being like, hey, um, this is my name, I use she, her pronouns, you know, or whatever you identify as if you're a cis person. That does make it easier to be like, oh cool, I'm Hayden, they, them, you know. Um, it's hard to always be the person to start that conversation, right? And do a, sorry, give my Please. own insight on that. Um, I'd say for me, it mostly just comes down to how often I have to interact with the person because uh, I'll give an actual example. Uh, in just a couple of weeks, I'll be taking a trip to Japan as a, a trip for my game design major. We'll be doing mobile app and game design there. Nice. And for the students who I'll be meeting mm -hmm. over at the university there, there's a good chance that I won't really have the time to, you know, explain pronouns to them. I will just be known as Noel, bottom line. Uh, given that it's more like a work environment, then of course that'll be more important to state because it'll be very frequently that I am referred to and it's just best to get it right as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, usually it just comes down to how frequently you need to talk about it because uh, I'm fine with people not understanding at first. I feel like there will always be future opportunities given there have to be. But uh, if it's going to be like a very common occurrence, then of course I want to make sure that it's right the first time. One of the things Hayden um, taught me uh, during this process was that if you make the mistake and, and misgender, for you in that moment and you realize it in that moment, just correct yourself and move on. Don't make it this awkward thing, right? Just move on. 
And if by chance, in the absence of Hayden, um, I mess up in front of someone else, it's desired then that, that someone else just corrects me, and then we just move on also, right? And it's just this, this piece of always just needing to be reminded. Um, I think we've heard about the importance of grace, right? And, and, and I, I would agree, I think so many um, are willing to extend that grace, but that can only last for so long, right? And I think that, um, you know, one of the things I've learned is that the intentionality also matters, right? And so that if someone sees, and Hayden shared this, if, if Hayden sees that there's effort being made, they are more likely to then continue to extend that grace, right? I have conversations with students um, with whom, you know, they said that their professors really worth messing up for a good while, right? I had a conversation, they had a conversation, I coached them through a conversation with their professor, and their professor they see, you know, making efforts. Do they always get it correct? No, right? But that's what's so great about an institution of higher learning, right? We say it's okay to come here and to make mistakes and to learn from them. Um, I really appreciate all of you all for sharing your stories and helping us learn. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.